People who are starving and wasting away have two options. Wait and hope for things to get better or do everything in their power to find food. The first episode of Starving for Truth covered many factors that led to the North Korean famine. In this episode, we will examine the desperation that came during the famine and the factors that prolonged it. Hi, my name is Dan Chung, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Crossing Borders. I have spent countless hours listening to the stories of North Koreans firsthand. I have also covered North Korea as a journalist, and it is my privilege to share this information with you today. A multitude of North Korean refugees have recounted tales of complete loss of community and cultural norms when starvation ravaged North Korea. Let's take a closer look at North Korea during the famine. North Korean society operated on a centralized system of distribution. All goods and many services were distributed by and through the North Korean government, with food being at the core of that system. The PDS took the food that the farmers grew and distributed it throughout the country. Farmers were allotted a portion of their crops for personal consumption, but most of the crops were to be given to the government for distribution. The government set the price of food and also paid everyone a predetermined wage based on the importance of their job to the regime. They distributed food to every village and set the price of food so that everyone could afford to eat, no matter what their occupation or status was. A great plan, right? That was until North Korea was confronted with the famine. You can learn more about this in our first video in this series in the upper right corner. From the very beginning, the system was designed to make society more fair and equal, but in practice, it was anything but that. The North Korean government favored people whose ancestors were loyal to Kim Il-sung. If anything was uncovered to the contrary, the individual, along with his or her family, was sent to the north, away from the privileges of the capital city, Pyongyang where only the most loyal families were allowed to live. These outer regions were hit the hardest by the famine, and consequently, the famine devastated those who were deemed least loyal to the regime. But the famine was so severe that it reached even the core of Kim Jong-il's inner circle. Stephen Haggard and Marcus Nolan said in their book, famine in North Korea that about 4 million people were spared from the extreme starvation that took place during the famine, but these people were not spared from all of it. They said, many, if not most of this group of 4 million almost certainly experienced food shortages and even hunger at some time during the famine. The food crisis of the 1990s thus cut at the very base of the regime's support and posed serious problems of political legitimacy and control. As the 90s progressed, the PDS went belly up. As food distributed by the PDS slowly dried up, farmers began to sell grain on the black market for 17 to 26 times the cost, according to Andrew Natsios. He said, this created an irresistible incentive for farmers to hide food from the state and sell it on the markets. The problem compounded itself. The less food the PDS had to sell, the higher the price on the black market went. The higher the price on the black market, the more incentive to sell on the black market. By the late 1990s, many refugees reported that the PDS had completely broken down and food was not being delivered except on national holidays. The exact death toll of the Great North Korean Famine is still unknown, but experts estimate that between 240,000 and 3.5 million lives were lost. 
But this statistic alone does not fully capture the utter horror the North Korean people experienced. According to the testimony of refugees in our network, bodies began to pile up on the side of the roads and near rivers. The stench of death came, and with it, a sense of impending desperation. People sold their clothing, furniture, homes, their sons and daughters, anything to stave off starvation. Refugees have reported to our staff many accounts of cannibalism in the face of hunger. Refugees said that it became commonplace to steal, cheat, and lie in order to survive. Barbara Demick in her book Nothing to Envy wrote this, The famine targets the most innocent, the people who would never steal food, lie, cheat, break the law, or betray a friend. The North Korean staple food became corn gruel, not because of tradition or taste, but because this is what the world gave the country in the form of food aid. North Koreans who were lucky ate corn gruel twice per day. We ate corn gruel, a refugee said to Crossing Borders founder Mike Kim in his book Escaping North Korea. Is there anything else to eat besides that in North Korea? In their desperation, North Koreans scrounged for food. Frogs, once a plentiful part of the North Korean landscape, came to near extinction as North Koreans, desperate for protein, looked to their surroundings for calories. Grass and tree bark became regular food additives for nutrition. The problem was that both these foods are not easily digestible for the human body and oftentimes made people even more sick. Pyongyang encouraged the North Korean people to search for food in the wilderness. By 1996, 30% of the average citizen's diet consisted of foraged food, according to Natsios. Mark Kirk of the U.S. House International Relations Committee in 1998 obtained a copy of a North Korean video on the harvesting of what the North Korean government called substitute food. This is what Natsios said about this video. In my decade of involvement in famine relief efforts, I have never seen such a bizarre manifestation of a hunger coping mechanism than this videotape. It showed, for example, how to harvest pondweed, dry it out, and make it into a flour to be mixed with wheat or corn flour as an extender. One refugee told our staff in 2012 that during the famine, she laid down to die by the river behind her house. She saw so many others die around her, and she felt so weak. But as she laid there, she didn't die. She watched the clouds in the sky roll by as she fell in and out of sleep. When she awoke, she was surprised that she had not died. She got up and started walking towards China. It is a crime for a North Korean to step into China without permission. And yet hundreds of thousands did just that in the wake of the famine. Most of those who did were women, and most of these women were sold as forced brides to China's poor and disabled men. North Korean refugees do not receive any rights in China, which is why people were able to sell and trade North Koreans like property. You can find out more about the refugee crisis in our video series, Breaking Down North Korea. The scars from the famine run deep. As someone who speaks to North Korean refugees on a regular basis, I'm still surprised at how far-reaching these scars are. In our next video, we will discuss the famine's lasting effects on North Korea and its people. Thanks for watching. <laughs>